Hi, this is Jonathan Lloyd Walker, the showrunner of Van Helsing and actor in Snowpiercer. You're listening to the Man Cave Chronicles podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to the party, pal. You're my boy, bro. Yo, it. It. A podcast with interviews of amazing guests from the world of pop culture. Oh, yeah. TV. Nice. Movies. Oh, I love the movies. Comedy and more from deep inside the Man Cave. Your host, Elias. Jonathan, welcome to the cave. Thank you for having me. How are you? What's new with you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm uh, busily working away up here in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, everything is uh, fantastic. You've been busy the last few years, huh? You're acting, producing, directing, showrunner. Man, I can keep going with this list. Yeah, it's been a it's been a very busy eighteen months. Uh, very, very, actually, very busy five or six years, but particularly the past eighteen months have been a bit crazy. Yeah. So I want the listeners to get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, where are you originally from? Uh, originally, I was born in England. I lived there until I was about 12 um, and then moved from there to Canada and lived uh, lived pretty much on and off, mostly in Canada, a little bit in the States. But um, um, yeah, I've made my home in uh, Montreal and Toronto and then now Vancouver. Wow. What, uh, what made your family move to, from England to Canada? Uh, my mom had remarried a Canadian, and um, we were at a point where he was saying, "Oh, you know, the life and the quality of life is so much better in the in Canada. We should move back." And so eventually we did, and um, so I came here, you know, at the at the age of thirteen, and and uh, made a life for myself here, and that's sort of where, I've, where the rest was played out. Wow. So uh, growing up, uh, I guess growing up in England and growing up in Canada, what were you into as a kid? Oh, well, definitely in England as a boy was sort of some of the earliest memories I have of, of getting into science fiction and storytelling and things like that. Um, there were some great English genre shows that were on when I was a kid, obviously Doctor Who, and there was a, a show called Space 1999 that I was a huge fan of, and UFO, and a number of other of sort of really seminal shows. They also did some really cool um, kid shows. You know, there was... Um, uh, the Thunderbirds and um, yeah. uh, and a whole bunch of other really cool, just little boutique shows that were just got your your imagination going. Obviously, also during that era, uh, when I was a kid, Star uh, Star Wars came out, and so you know, going to see that in the movie theater lit a fire in me to want to story tell and be in these sort of imaginary worlds. So, I definitely grew up in England, being very heavily influenced by genre and science fiction. Oh wow! And then what about when you made the transition to Canada? Well, Canada was an interesting transition because back in those days, obviously, you know, pre, pre-internet pre days, I'd say that to my kids sometimes, and they're like, it's as if I'm describing a time when there was no oxygen. <laughs> um, but obviously, back in those days, the cultures were a little bit more isolated. England was its own thing, and Canada was its own thing, and the States was its own thing. And so I arrived in Canada, and culturally, it was very different. It felt very different. I mean, I'd never experienced ice hockey before, and everyone here was completely obsessed with it. And um, you know, and obviously different weather and winters that I'd never experienced before and TV and, you know, TV was different. I arrived, the very first show that everybody in my school was talking about was a show called Dukes of Hazard. Okay. And we'd never, I'd never seen Dukes of Hazard in, in Canada, in England. And, and it was a weird experience to arrive and be like, this is the show that everyone's crazy about. I don't understand. So there was a bit of a rejig. Um, of trying to, you know, get uh, to understand um, North American culture and, and how it was different than English culture. And again, one of the things that helped me with that was sort of digging into genre. And, um, you know, one of the touchstone shows that was just, it was constantly on repeat, because back in those days, syndicated shows were always re-airing. So it was the original Star Trek series. Um, and that was every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., you know, on the weekends, Star Trek was on. So I would tune in and watch Star Trek, and it was sort of, again, one of my beginning introductions to some of the type of storytelling and, and, and TV shows that were available in, in, on this side of the, the, the ocean. Yes. When did you decide that, while you were growing up, when did you decide that, okay, this is what I want to get into? I want to get into acting, producing, directing? Well, some of my earliest experiences were with acting because, you know, obviously it was a more accessible medium in, in terms of doing school plays and doing skits and things like that. And um, the school I grew up in, in, or the neighborhood I grew up in in England, I went to a little elementary school that just so happened to be the same elementary school that Christian Bale went to. 
And so I was very good friends with the Bale family and his sisters, his two older sisters were, um, you know, schoolmates of mine and, and Christian was at the same school as well. Anyway, his mum was one of the people who um, helped uh, put on plays and little shows and stuff uh, at, at the school. And so my first experience of getting involved in things was, was with them. And that kind of lit this imagination of, oh, wow, acting, acting's fun. You get to be up in front of people and they're all watching what you're doing and you get to sort of play this escapist little, you know, different type of person. And so that was really what lit the, the fire for me to want to maybe be an actor. Wow. Now, was there any other specific movie or TV show that pushed you towards this as well? Um, you know, I mean, certainly as I got older, I got into other things. I was definitely into some of the old, more classic television shows. So I loved the Twilight Zone and I loved the Outer Limits and, uh, you know, and then I started getting into movies. I got into some of the George Romero zombie movies and there's certain things, certain eras through my teenage years that really sort of started me thinking about just the creative process as, as a whole. And definitely I was more drawn by genre than I was by, you know, let's say sitting and watching a cop show. Okay. So that definitely, you know, uh, th that was what was the, the catalyst for me of wanting to get involved in, in, in making television as well as just being in it as an actor. Yeah. So uh, when you, after you grew up and you went, to, I assume you went to study acting and producing? Well, I, uh, during, it was never the primary focus of what I went to school for, but it was always something I did, you know, in amongst. So okay. through high school, I did, I did plays, I was involved in Montreal with something called the Children's Theatre of Montreal. Um, and uh, and then into, I, you know, as a kid in England, I'd done TV commercials and, and a little amateur theatre, and, and, and then I continued to do that through university. And it wasn't until I'd been through some other, you know, career permutations slightly after university that I was like, I think maybe I want to try and just focus on acting as a career. And so then I did really delve into studying and I went and did scene study and I went and I did voice classes and I went and I did movement classes and I really dug deep into it. And, and that was when I really got hooked and was like, no, this is definitely what I want to try and chase first. Wow. What was the, what was your experiences like taking acting classes? Well, you know, I mean, it, it, the interesting thing is there's a certain type of personality that will succeed as an actor and there's a certain type of personality that, that, that won't. I mean, you, you've got to be willing to even if you're not comfortable with it at first you've got to become comfortable with the idea of being fairly emotionally naked and what i mean by that is it's a very vulnerable place to put yourself you know even though you're playing a role you're playing a different person you still got to access certain things within yourself so if the role is somebody who's emotionally distraught and crying and upset or afraid you've got to allow yourself to portray that in front of a room full of people that you don't know and so early on, I think the biggest step with acting is to allow yourself the freedom to go, it's going to be okay. I can, I can let myself do these things in front of these people, partly because I'm playing a role, but also because this is the job. I've got to dig deep inside and bring these things out of me in order to make these characters real. So that was a, that was a big step for early on, and I think it is for most actors. Yeah. What, was the, what was your first gig when you broke into the career? The very first thing I did professionally is that once I'd made that decision to actually become a professional actor, um, you know, I'd, I'd done a couple of commercials, but in terms, of, in terms of film and TV, there was a TV movie that was here uh, that I shot in Vancouver in, what would that have been, 1992 or three? was a, a TV movie called Beyond Control that, um, uh, that I'm trying to remember who was in that um, uh, oh, Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore was in it. Wow. So, yeah, it was uh, a, a TV movie, and, and um, I had a little part as a reporter, and it was my first experience of being in front of the camera on a paid gig. Oh, wow. So now uh, now you're the showrunner for Van Helsing. For the listeners, uh, tell the sh obviously the show the, the show's based off the movie, but how close is it to the to the movie? Not actually based off the movie. It's It's... Um, it, it's no, oh, wow. uh, Van, Hel Van Helsing is obviously a character that comes out of the Bram Stoker Dracula novels. Okay. And so um, there's been various different ways of interpreting that um, original source material. Um, that source material is obviously written in the Victorian era. So the traditional way of, of positioning that material is to do a Victorian kind of steampunky version of things. So that's what the movies were. Our story takes place present day. Um, where there's been, uh, you know, vampires have been living amongst us, but we didn't know because they were basically living in secret and living in the shadows. 
Um, but in our first season, there was a big volcanic eruption that happens that darkens the skies. And because it darkens the skies, it allows the vampires to come out of the shadows and be out during the day. And they basically take over. They start biting and turning people, and, and eventually, you know, the rest of what's left of humankind has to go into hiding themselves to, to stay alive. So it's definitely a post-apocalyptic, present-day version of Van Helsing. Our title character is a woman, um, and she is of the Van Helsing lineage. So in other words, she doesn't know at first, but she's a descendant of that whole line of Van Helsings that dates back to the Victorian era. And uh, the unique thing about our show that makes us different than a lot of other vampire mythology shows is she has a unique ability, and her ability is that if she bites a vampire, she can turn the vampire back to human. Oh, wow. So that puts us in a particularly unique bit of storytelling with that uh, that particular trait. So you started off as a writer in that show. How did you end up being the showrunner? Well, all writing rooms are, there's a various stage of hierarchy within a writing room. So, you know, when you start out as a writer in television, you start out near the bottom of the ladder, and you're what's called a, a story editor, or you start as a script coordinator, and then you sort of slowly make your way up the ladder. All writing in a, in a TV writing room eventually leads to some level of producing because you have to creatively shepherd the project uh, into production and help with that process. And the more senior you become in, with that level of experience, the higher up that ladder you climb through tiers like consulting producer and associate producer and co-producer, and then eventually co-executive producer and then executive producer and then eventually showrunner. So I just have methodically kind of worked my way through a number of rooms on a number of different shows and gained the experience to, you know, and quite luckily be eventually given the opportunity to, to run a show. Yeah. How, would, how do you explain the position showrunner for somebody that doesn't know what it is? Uh, well, showrunner is a fairly complex title because you're effectively the head writer of the show but you're also the creative, um, you know, you're the captain of the ship creatively. So it's your job to make sure that, you know, the crew are executing the creative vision of the show, that you're hiring the right directors to actually, you know, um, pull off the vision of the show, the right actors to be cast in the roles to play the characters that you've written. And you're making sure that all of the trajectory of the story is not only being weaved through the scripts, but is also being carried out and executed properly on set, but then also in post. You're there to make sure that all of the post-production happens in a way that, that fits the tone and style that you have in mind. You're, you're very much the creative uh, captain of it all. But there's a great documentary for people who are interested in what a showrunner does uh, that's literally called Showrunners. And uh, I believe you can get it on Netflix. You can certainly get it through uh, the iTunes store. It's a great little documentary that gives you a window into what that job entails on a day-to-day -day basis and, and how, uh, how complex it is. Oh, wow. Not all the years in the industry, you've done acting, producing, like I said, writing, and show runner. What do you enjoy the most out of all of it? Well, I'm always somebody who's wanted to wear more than one hat. So I, 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 I'm loath to, it's sort of like asking somebody to pick their favorite child. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love them all, and, and it, they're all, they all, you know, are, are different. And, um, I, you know, I, a lot of people thought that when I got into a position where I was going to be a showrunner that I would say, oh, well, and I'm not going to do any of the other things. I'm not going to act anymore. Or, or such, and, and, and I, I really have been very fortunate that I haven't had to give that up entirely. I don't do as much acting as I used to, but every once in a while I'll still step outside of uh, show running and act. I just tend not to do it on my own shows. I tend to keep it for, you know, like I used to, acting on somebody else's show. Yeah. How, now how did you get involved with like uh, Wu Assassins? You have the same title for that too, correct? Yeah, um, I, I got involved with Wu Assassins. Um, it's actually the, the showrunner on Wu Assassins, a guy called John Wirth, um, who uh, some people will know from Hell on Wheels. And um, uh, he, you know, he, he, basically John worked in a way where he wanted to largely be uh, in Los Angeles. The show was going to be produced here in Vancouver. So he needed somebody of a sort of a showrunner level to be able to be up here and kind of surrogate the job for him and execute his vision creatively on his behalf. So I was brought in, the same production studio uh, that oversaw Wu Assassins is the same one that does Van Helsing. So they basically called me in and said, hey, look, there's this project, would you like to be involved? And I read the, uh, the pilot for it and I was like, yeah, this sounds really cool. And I knew John's reputation and, and the kind of quality of stuff that he does. And I was like, this sounds like a really unique project. And so uh, I jumped on board. And now we mentioned I mentioned earlier about acting, and now you're going to be in Snowpiercer in 2020, and you play Big John. Tell us about the the show and the the role you're playing. 
Well, um, Snowpiercer is, again, based off the same material, uh, the underlying um, material that the movie was based off of. Um, and it's, you know, it's essentially a story about a post-apocalyptic train uh, built by an eccentric billionaire who knew that this great environmental cataclysm was going to come and that the earth was going to freeze. And he offered an opportunity for wealthy people to secure their future and their family's future by getting on board this train that would continue to move around the planet, but would provide them with safety and sustenance and, and a quality of life while everyone else on earth was going to die in this horrible cataclysm. But what ends up happening is as that train is going to leave the station, a bunch of other people basically storm on board as well. And the only way for basically the train to continue to move forward and to coexist with everybody on board is it breaks down into class. So the rich people are at the front, and then there's sort of second class and third class passengers who do all the grunt work. And then there's the poor people at the back that were never supposed to be on the train in the first place. And they're called the tailies. And so that's one of the characters, the character that I play is one of the tailies, who's, you know, this really impoverished poverty class at the back of the train that's desperate to change their circumstances and to, you know, and have more of what's uh, available at the front of the train. So that's what drives the plot of the of the show in the same way that it drove the plot of the movie. Yeah. Uh, how did you prepare for the role and uh, what kind of research did you do for the role? Um, well, I did a fairly deep dive on it in the sense that I, I went all the way back to the original French comics and read those and I watched the feature film version of it and um, you know, obviously had some good creative conversations with the uh, creative people involved in the show and, and kind of got a handle on, on, on what it was going to be. It was also a role, interestingly enough, where um, I, I was asked to put on a little bit of weight before it started so that I could lose weight as the show went on. And uh, the creatively, you'll find out when you watch the show why that is. But um, so that was an interesting way of preparing for it, too. It was one of the first times where it was like, oh, I have to eat a lot of food before <laughs> I start working on this project. So at the, creatively, I just was, you know, read a lot about the character and tried to immerse myself in what that would be like being trapped and, you know, kind of almost like a in, in a way, almost like a concentration camp victim of being stuck in a situation where you don't know if you're going to live or die and, and everyone around you is suffering. And, and how are you going to change that set of circumstances? Wow. Now, um Throughout the years that you've been acting and everything, like who are some of your influences in the acting world? Is there anybody that you look up to? Oh, there's lots of people I look up to, and this, unfortunately, I've been able to work with a bunch of them. Um, one of them in particular would be John Malkovich. Um, I did uh, a film with him and, and Bruce Willis and Helen Mirren um, and Morgan Freeman a few years ago called Red. Um, and that was a great opportunity to literally, I mean, it's like a master class when you work with a guy like Malkovich, you're just seeing the, the, one of the best guys uh, do his craft. And so that was a really unique opportunity. Um, but yeah, I've worked, with, I've worked with lots of cool actors over the years. And, and I mean, I've always tried to, the thing for me is I've, I've never been interested in, uh, you know, the, the good looking lead role characters, because the reality is the character actors are much more important to me because that's what I am. I'm a character actor. So you know, I love guys like Sam Rockwell and, you know, and I, I, I love uh, I love the people who who aren't the top name on the marquee, but that come in and do the most interesting work. Yeah. Uh, Gary Oldman and people like that. It's just that that's that's what I'm inspired by those those type of character actors. Is there somebody that you hope you get to work with one day that's like on your list? Um. Well, you know, I mean, I've, as I said, I've, I've been super lucky to work with a lot of those people. I mean, I worked with Christopher Walken a number of years yeah. ago. He's right up there on my list. Um, right now, it's sort of, for me, it's, it's, there's an interesting new breed of actors that's coming along, um, and some, some of them are really interesting. In, in, ironically, I guess pro probably one of the people that I would love to work with that I haven't had a chance to since we were kids is Christian. It would be fun to be reunited because we went on this journey separately, but we started out together, yeah. um, and to be able to come now full circle and actually do a part in a project with him would be actually kind of fun. That's awesome. Now, what do you think has been your biggest achievement so far in the field? Uh, well, I mean, I would just say this this past year has you know been a real pinnacle for me because um, you know I, it's the first year where I got to both act in something fairly high profile. Uh, be involved in four different shows within the course of a calendar year, all of which I'm very proud of, um, and get to, you know the opportunity to show run uh, a show like Van Helsing, 
Um, all of those things happening simultaneously uh, within a year, uh, I think, is a pretty big achievement. So I, I would definitely say that. Hmm. So what's some, what is a, some advice that you give out to somebody that comes up to you and tells you they, they want to get into the business? Well, my first thing is, uh, if they say they want to get into the business, I say I, I would immediately say, well, then you need to figure out what part of the business you want to get into, because this business is, I mean, it would be like saying, I want to join the orchestra. Well, what instrument do you want to play? Yeah. Um, because you, you have to specialize. It's an industry of trying to specialize. You can end up doing more than one thing, but unless you've developed a really good skill set at something, you're not going to be able to get much traction. So. That's the first piece of advice. Get uh, get get very really clear about what you want to do, and then look at the pathway to get there, because the first step isn't always just starting to do that job. I I, I taught a bunch of kids at a film school a number of years ago, and I said, you know, what do you guys all want to do? And the majority of them were like, produce or direct. I was like, great. How are you going to get there? And they're like, well, we're going to produce or we're going to direct. And my answer to that was, well, but no one's going to let you do that right out of the gate. You're not just going to get to start there. Yeah. You've got to climb the ladder and you've got to figure out the pathway to get there. So, you know, it's important that anybody getting into this business has a realistic understanding that this, is a, this isn't just a, a light switch you're going to flick on and off. You've got to actually build through and have a strategy of how you're going to develop your skills to get to where you want to get to. Yeah. Uh, and that requires research, that requires hard work, that requires, you know, developing a really clear skill set. There's, there's a bunch of steps, and that you've got to look at that. What's the best advice you were given to when you broke into the business? Uh, the best advice uh, I was given, and it's advice that I've given my kids, is um, do not, by any stretch of the imagination, get into this business because you think that it's going to lead to you being famous or rich. Because the reality is, first of all, there's only a very small percentage of people who get into the, this business and end up in either of those two categories. And the second part of it is, this is a business that requires you to love the work, not the result. And so if you, are, if you, if you, you know, uh, my kids do it all the time. They, they see, you know, celebrities on screen and they're like, oh my God, wouldn't it be great to get invited to movie premieres and to have everyone want to take your picture and to get driven places in a limo? That's not the job. The job is coming to work every day and working with other people to create something and to be involved in a process. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to love that part of it. And if you don't start out with that intention, you will never end up getting anywhere with your career. And, um, and that's the best piece of advice I was given, and it's the best piece of advice I can hand on. Without mentioning any names, do you ever run into like actors or actresses that kind of like they just come to work just to come to work and leave? Or, like They're not like into it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, you know, there's certain people. As much as it's an industry of hard work, of course, there's there's situations of just pure luck, yeah. where somebody who doesn't have the temperament for it, or somebody who doesn't have the interest in it, or somebody who's a bit of a, a jerk, they just fall on their feet somehow and become a, a celebrity, and not by merit but by circumstance. And I've encountered them for sure. And you know, the, the, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that eventually karma gets those people because I don't think you can be somebody who's negative and toxic and disrespectful and really end up having a lengthy career because eventually people realize and they just stop that. Yeah. But the other thing is I, I worked with an actor whose name I won't mention and his whole motto would say it when he would arrive on set. He'd go to the first AD who kind of runs this, you know, the schedule and the, 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 the day and he would say, you know how the Marines have that, uh, that motto, first in, last to leave? He said, I'm the opposite. That's my motto. <laughs> Last guy in, first guy to go. Wow. He just didn't want to be there. He was a guy who liked celebrity. He liked getting the paycheck, but he didn't like doing the work. Mm. And I could see how much that was toxic to him as a person, but I could see how toxic it was to everybody that had to work with him. And I just thought to myself, Ugh, that's just so, like, get out, because like, you heard it. You just not, it's not productive. Oh. So that's something. You, you do run across people like that every once in a while, but... You'd be amazed the number of really, really lovely, genuine, um, warm, and, and gracious people that you end up working with in this business, yeah. um, particularly actors. And some of them are hugely famous, and you just think, oh, wow, this person's so normal and so great. And it's a refreshing thing to come across. So on your downtime when you're not working, I don't know if you even have a downtime anymore. Like, What do you enjoy doing? Well, I'm a big family guy, so I've got, I've got three kids. So, um, you know, this, this business does take a lot of my time and a lot of my focus, and I try as best as possible to make uh, my wife and my kids my number one priority when I'm not working. So I spend a lot of time, you know, standing beside a soccer pitch watching my kids chase a ball. Uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, out riding bikes and, and going on hikes and stuff with them. 
Um, you know, I, I love, we were very blessed in Vancouver to live in a beautiful outdoorsy environment. So in the wintertime, I ski. Um, in the summertime, I paddleboard and, and kayak and, um, you know, spend a lot of time just outdoors enjoying uh, uh, all the benefits of being in this beautiful city. Yeah. Uh, where do you see yourself uh, 10, 20 years from now? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I would hope that in as, as things have gone uh, in the past few years, I would hope to continue this trajectory, you know, over the next 10 years. I would love to be able to create some uh, shows that are mine, that are really got my fingerprints all over them. Obviously, Van Helsing, I, I inherited Van Helsing. I stepped into it to take it over um, as a showrunner, and that's great. I love this show, but there's certainly some ideas in that have been burning a hole in the back of my brain that I want to see executed. So I definitely want to get some of my own sh- shows up and going. I would love to get a feature off the ground, um, you know, f- feature film, uh, something not necessarily a big, you know, uh, spectacle science fiction thing, actually a real nuanced character piece, just something that's really, you know, hopefully indelible and lasting. Um, and then in 20 years, I'd be perfectly honest, I hope that I'm probably at the at the point in my career where I don't work a lot, yeah. um, where I'm able to just enjoy a bit of uh, retirement and be the person who people come to for advice and help mentor others in their careers. Uh, that would be a pretty great place to be in 20 years. That's great. Uh, lastly, how can the listeners find you on social media? Uh, well, I've got a, a small but but you know relevant social media footprint. So the Twitter handle and Instagram handle are both the same, at J underscore L underscore Walker. Uh, on my website, JonathanLloydWalker.com. That's uh, Lloyd with two L's. And um, yeah, that's the best. Those are the best places to find me. All right, John. Thank you for coming on. This was great. Really appreciate it. Take care.